The Terminator Future Shock and Skynet are first-person shooters developed and published by Bethesda Softworks for DOS in 1995 and 1996, respectively. Bethesda would develop a total of five Terminator games of varying quality, now no longer available for retail, probably due to licensing issues. The reason I'm focusing on Future Shock and its sequel is that I feel they have never really gotten much credit as fairly sophisticated pioneers in the then-emerging first-person shooter genre. Future Shock is notable for being the first X-Engine game, and became one of the first shooters to feature fully textured 3D environments and enemies. Never one to not make use of an in-house engine, Bethesda would reuse the X-Engine later in Daggerfall, Battlespire, and Redguard, and even racing sims like X-Car Experimental Racing and Burnout Championship Drag Racing. The engine's strength in fully textured 3D environments lends itself to a freedom not really seen before in a nascent genre that had really only known corridor shooters. Now you could get lost in the desolate architecture of a demolished city, amongst a cemetery of identical streets, with tombs and headstones made of crumbling apartments and other decaying structures. In fact, I frequently did get lost, exploring one half of the map to the other, avoiding the craters pockmarking the road filled with hazardous radiation, Within this open playground, there are abandoned stores and apartments to loot. Several missions even have you driving a weaponized jeep or a captured hunter-killer. In addition, we have a huge armory of weapons. Future Shock would also champion the use of mouse look, have a dedicated button for throwable explosives, and be one of the first games to shift the movement keys to the left side of the keyboard in a default config just a few keys short of modern WASD. Despite this, many reviewers more familiar with the cursor key setup of Doom and holding alt to strafe like troglodytes would complain of the difficulty of the controls. Those who adapted would go on to praise it, becoming enlightened greater beings of a new vanguard. Skynet is quite brief, and was intended as an expansion pack to Future Shock that was released as a standalone title that allowed you to play the previous game with an updated resolution of 640x480. SVGA. Naturally, this is how I played the game, using unofficial patch 1.01, which fixes some bugs, gives you back the better looking Black Knight Sky from Future Shock over the blue one in Skynet, and also increases the draw distance. The patch doesn't fix all problems, as on several occasions I had to cheat to manually finish the mission when certain scripted flags never triggered. The Terminator Skynet also launched with multiplayer, which I wish I had the opportunity to play. This featured asymmetrical PvP with slower, more durable Terminators fighting nimble, fragile humans, and turreted jeeps you could enter and exit alongside your squad five years before Halo. It actually sounds like a blast. Let's talk about how I felt about the gameplay. As previously mentioned, the adoption of a fully 3D world brought with it a more three-dimensional control layout which can easily be rebound to something quite comfortable, and the game plays very much like a primitive but surprisingly feature-complete modern shooter. Rooms, apartments and whole streets are optional. Ducking into an abandoned convenience store for some ammo and health evokes nostalgic echoes to me of playing Bethesda's much later released Fallout games. The forces of the AI Skynet are slow, methodical and noisy. Their metal frames can often take quite a pounding, and some can dish it out just as well. Thankfully, you often hear them before you see them, as their joints whir and their metal feet clunk against the pavement, marching inexorably towards you. And here the patch that increases draw distance probably gives a great advantage, as often they won't react if engaged outside of a certain range, and hunter-killer debris will hang miraculously in the air until you approach close enough for reality to kick in. You can also selectively dismember the robots, or rather, the robots can lose some of their weapons and keep attacking, playing into the theme of a durable and relentless foe. Enemies also explode on death, dealing damage to anything and anyone nearby. This lends these games towards having a more thoughtful, tactical air than you might typically expect for the time, 
death can come relatively quickly, and even if health and armor are liberally scattered through the level, they are not infinite. The gameplay often requires an approach that is slow and methodical as the robots that pursue you. Of these, there's an extensive array of mechanized enemies, from nimble drones to hunter-killer bombers, robots on tracks or bipedal terminators, through to towering robots that resemble glimpse scenes from the future war in the first two films. A design of Bethesda's own is this Flenser unit. To deal with these enemies, by the end of the game you'll be hauling a comically large array of guns, each variant more ammo hungry than the last. Carefully engaging enemies with the most efficient weapon for the scenario is a rewarding part of the gameplay loop. For example, one of the more efficient weapons against Terminators, the Grenade Launcher, is a sort of challenge to use. Carefully free aiming a lobbed grenade into a robot's agonizingly slim frame and watching the debris of the explosion take out the surrounding enemies is satisfying on a number of levels, being challenging, efficient, and kinetically pleasing. These same grenades can be thrown along with Molotovs and pipe bombs, but all these are crazily difficult to use. Sometimes I wonder if the pipe bombs would have actually been a fun multiplayer meme at one point. The single player enemies can be bullet sponges, which is thematic and initially doesn't seem much of a concern as ammo is everywhere, except for the fact that you can still pick up both health and ammo even while at full capacity. Perhaps in the Terminator universe they are a vital source of calories. That said, running out of ammo did not happen often, so I'm complaining about something that's barely an issue, but it perhaps sticks out in my mind because it is again compounded by having to search the maze-like ruins and wandering large, previously cleared areas was often my most poignant impression and cause for disappointment with the game. Accidentally picking up things when you're at full capacity just adds to the anguish. The driving sections are… functional, even if the car can't go uphill very well, but likewise this requires a cautious approach, especially since attackers are numerous and there is no way to repair. The hunter killer on the other hand absolutely trivializes everything as it's typically too fast and can remain outside of danger. In the mission briefing, you were warned about the radiation that pulls within the craters, some of which tantalize treacherously with weapons or ammo. There's a Geiger counter on the UI, which is unnecessary since the screen turning red tends to be the thing one notices first. Hidden away areas and supplies on rooftops and other unmarked secrets offer tasty little treats. But it's difficult to praise the level design, each mission is far too large and it's easy to get lost. This is a consequence of the open design and also the infancy of the genre that had yet not really explored the delicate science of using perspective, geometry and assets to signpost the correct path. The freeform gigantic nature of the missions also leads to often sluggish pacing as you wander around bored and lost looking for a breadcrumb trail of enemies or the telltale whirring of robotic limbs to lead you the right way. On several occasions I had to return to the briefing screen to remind myself of my objectives. The in-game map is useless being tethered to your position and unable to move far enough to provide any sort of direction. Some of these design complaints really only apply to Future Shock. Skynet seems to have learned from these mistakes with 8 shorter missions hitting the high points of the first game without overstaying its welcome and is probably the best way to experience what these titles have to offer. I played both games on medium difficulty and the enemies in Skynet required less bullets to put down, so it's clear there was some reflection over this by the developers. This being a Bethesda game there are still plenty of bugs. In addition to mission flags that wouldn't trigger forcing me to cheat to regress to the next mission, you can also easily get stuck on doors if you open them while too close. There are a couple occasions where you can throw yourself into a pit out of which you can't escape, which is sort of an unspoken rule of design most developers would understand on principle. Some of the game's problems, like the pacing, the ammo economy and issues with level design, might well have been avoided with a more savvy developer, but it could well be argued that another developer might never have had the ambition to break the mould like this. Spoilers ahead. If getting decades old games spoiled is too much, skip to here. The game begins with a grainy cutscene showing a nuclear explosion in present day 1995 Los Angeles. 
then cuts away to a hunter killer searching the smouldering ruins of civilization. With lasers painting your silhouette on nearby walls like a Looney Tunes cartoon, you narrowly avoid a spider robot, while your savior launches a Molotov at your pursuer, succeeding only for himself to be blasted away. I can confirm this is the typical result of trying to use Molotovs. We follow with a briefing given by a dying man who gives you his gun and tells you to reach the Tiki Grand Hotel to retrieve his car, and to go find John Connor and join the resistance. This is your first mission objective. The game then releases you into a fairly open map, giving you a crash course introduction on what's to come. In one area there's a Skynet outpost which can be accessed by bringing down a generator, and is completely optional. Residual radiation gathers in craters pockmarking the roads. In a showcase to the power of Bethesda's new 3D engine, we fight across the floors of a hotel like that one Judge Dredd movie scene and tight walk across a girder before we are finally able to make it to the car. We drive and gun our way through the robot patrols and turrets until we are finally able to meet with the resistance. John Connor is a strong man with tired eyes that convey an experience of horror bolstered by an unshakable resolve and a chiseled jaw that conveys a life of discipline and mewing. Major Catherine Parker, his second in command, looks like she doesn't put up with nonsense. Dr. Hanover insists you call him Bill. Before the war he was a geneticist, but now he operates as the resistance chief technician. Finally there's Captain Milton Bishop, an old veteran, but when he hears about the next mission to rescue prisoners from a Skynet death camp, he tells you you've got to be crazy to attempt such a thing. John Connor reprimands him and speaks on his faith in you, based off your survival up until that point. So we set off. A satchel charge takes down the fence. There are three barracks in total to search through. To your dismay, each contains only corpses. Until you reach the third and are told three prisoners have fled in the commotion. You follow in their wake through tunnels filled with poo water, the whirring of motorized joints surrounding you all the while. The resistance then manages to salvage a hunter killer down somewhere in the irradiated wastes, which plays a key role in bringing the fight to Skynet. When you fly home from successful test flight, destroying Skynet systems, you return to be notified Bishop is presumed to be dead. You need to take his place in the next mission by sabotaging some satellite dishes. The soldiers are also reporting strange occurrences, robots appearing after flashes of lights, feelings of deja vu before suffering devastating attacks. You experience such attacks yourself, but still carry out your objective. But the news when you radio into base is even stranger. Before they could even know it was happening, Terminators had infiltrated the resistance base and opened fire while they were caught unawares. They had been familiar with blatant Skynet imposters with rubber skin, but these Terminators wore real flesh, and what's more, they wore the face of Bishop. Once you have rescued the survivors, including a young Kyle Reese, you have a few moments to discuss the implications before undertaking a sequence of missions to strike back at Skynet. You go where Connor needs you, destroying defenses, an airdrome, and taking out several convoys and transmission systems. Eventually, Dr. Hanover decrypts some startling information. First, the Skynet is using tachyon pulses to send data back in time. Second, Bishop defected to Skynet for who knows what reward, voluntarily revealing everything he knew on the Resistance. Your next mission has you tying up this loose end. You must search a research lab to put an end to Bishop. Or don't because the game is bugged and wouldn't let me kill him. Dr. Hanover eventually locates the source of the time disturbances, a complex housing what he calls the Temporal Data Transmitting System which is relaying information back in time, not just to win battles it had already lost, but to reach into the past to Cyberdyne's original Skynet terminal in 1995, to rewrite its program to paradoxically birth its own sentience. In response, the resistance creates a virus that will overwrite the code already transmitted, 
and thereby prevent the war from ever happening. It takes several missions to break through the heavy defenses of the temporal facility and fight your way to the inner core to upload the virus to the five required terminals before making your escape. You prepare to meet death just as the results of your success reverberate through time, causing history to deviate once again. How this fits in with the movie timeline is unclear. In the original 1984 film, Carl Reese states that they had won, but Skynet had sent a Terminator back to kill Sarah Connor as a last resort. It's never a fun time when we have to quibble over multiple timelines. Onto Skynet, which, based on the characters and the use of the Hunter Killer, suggests the game is set in either an alternate timeline or some time during the events of Future Shock. Since its 1996 full motion video is everywhere, leading to an unprecedented degree of realism. All of our old friends are here. Catherine Parker with Tactical Exposed Midriff. Good to have you aboard. Dr. Bill Hanover is here looking old and doctorly. You could call me Bill. Carl Reese now has big Wesley Crusher type energy. Nick. Yeah, well, you can't be too careful around here. Connor looks kind of more like a mechanic than a soldier, but okay, it probably helps to be a mechanic in the future war. It heads west through the hills and then cuts south. Though typically taciturn, even the player now has a voice. Alright then, I'd better get going. See you at base. Your first mission is to find out what's going on in a Skynet facility. You sneak inside by stowing aboard an automated truck and work your way through the defenses only to stand in the shadow of a mighty phallic artifact from before the war. It's bigger than any I've seen before. Robots swarm the streets as you attempt to escape. Too many to fight. An endless army converging on you as you dash for the car. When you break through the Skynet forces and reach base, Dr. Hanover explains that it's a Hades missile, capable of leveling an entire city. It's a city killer, John. The biggest nuke ever made. They say it can turn a city to dust. Your next task is to reach the basement of the old Cyberdyne building to find data to help disable the warhead, which itself leads you to a nuclear submarine. Just as you download the data from the sub's terminal, an explosion wrecks the vessel. You wade and swim through flooded compartments to reach the torpedo bays and narrowly avoid drowning by firing your body through a launch tube. Next, you must race after the convoy taking the missile to a test silo in the eastern desert in preparation of launch. Setting off again by air after failing by wheel, you reach the silo, access some terminals and change the target location. The game ends with a missile exploding somewhere over the ocean and then a scene of a hunter-killer flying over the ruins of the city, beams searching for still living humans, and reusing part of the opening cutscene from Future Shock. The Resistance narrowly escapes destruction to hold on to life for one more day. As much as I enjoy the sheer spectacle of standing in the shadow of the nuke, fighting my way out of a sinking submarine, and the fun of chasing the convoy down a highway, when I take a step back I can't help but think that an AI that can invent laser guns, cyborgs, time travel and mass produced robot hordes could probably make any sort of weapon of mass destruction without resorting to some antiquated pre-war tech left lying around by fallible, disgusting meat walkers. Regardless of the plausibility of the story, it's still a fun time and the Skynet story moves the scenery along more competently than Future Shock. Let's talk about these sorts of stories more generally. Well-known cantankerous sci-fi writer Harlan Ellison sued the production of the Terminator movie for plagiarism against the script he'd written for The Outer Limits in 1964, Soldier, which itself expanded from Ellison's 1957 time travel story, Soldier from Tomorrow. This resulted in a settlement and a credit on the Terminator film, a result James Cameron states he wasn't responsible for and which he disagrees with. 
Personally, I'm not usually fond of fiction dealing with time travel, since it almost always results in some trite paradox or multiple timeline navel-gazing. Despite some online misinformation on the matter, Harlan Ellison's lawsuit never included accusations of stealing the idea for an AI from his short story, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream, surprising considering how litigious he could be. I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream would itself get an adventure game a few months after Future Shock in 1995, a story that depicts a godlike vindictive AI called Anne, created when the military computers of the US, China and the Soviet Union merged and turned on its creators. These fears of the Cold War echo through similar fiction. The movie Screamers from 1995 was based on the 1953 Philip K. Dick short story, The Second Variety, where the movie depicts hostile robots posing as humans in a battle between two fictional forces. In the original short story, these are descended from Soviet weapons. In another similar story, the movie War Games in 1983, the AI called Whopper almost starts a nuclear war with Russia and serves as a decent introduction to mad doctrine. The Terminator avoids these Cold War references directly and presents us instead with the tale of humanity's own weapons turning against it. The way it avoids descending into outright luddism is by not taking itself seriously enough to allow us all to gloat over how these same weapons really do look pretty cool. As dated as these games seem now, it was an exciting time to observe how we were increasingly able to simulate real world environments. Few if any games had hitherto seen this level of scale and vertical expression. Observe this scene in a mission Skynet with its dock, its elevated approach across construction equipment, the submarine and the sunken boat. Various 2D assets help in realising the grim setting and reinforce the horror of the future war. One of the more striking is this mode of skulls or mass grave. Some places, particularly this disco and Skynet, remind me a great deal of Duke Nukem 3D. The guns, which are 2D assets, seem a little too clean in comparison to the world, but are consistent with what you would expect from the Terminator franchise. These games are far from pretty, but they are at the very least visually faithful to the franchise. It would be a long time before the world would be ready for shooters to rise above greys and browns, and a Terminator game would not be the game to do it in. The sound effects are limited, simple but effective. Or perhaps they just feel limited after hours of wandering its massive levels and hearing the sounds of bullets, lasers and robots over and over again, interspersed by my grunts of pain in-game and in real life. In comparison to some other games at the time, weapon sound effects lack punch, making the bouncing 2D weapon sprites fall a little flat. The original Doom shotgun feels great to this day. The Terminator shotgun... Eh. The whirring of motors and thuds of metal limbs on the pavement keeps you alert for active enemies, giving you a sense of frequently being harried by relentless pursuers. The soundtrack by Andy War is mostly decent with some really good industrial ambient reimagining of the familiar Terminator motif, which I find really memorable. Occasionally, the music does not transcend its origins as a product of the 90s, by which I mean certain things like synth panpipes should be targeted for erasure by a time agent. As for Skynet's cutscenes, audio quality is unfortunately not great, and voices are often muffled. It's bigger than any I've seen before. These Terminator games are very flawed, especially when you compare them to the fun-loving abandon offered by its polished competitors. 
ID software and 3D realms. The various innovative ideas and impressive 3D technology, all present in one first-person game, was a leap forward for the genre as a whole, prefiguring many of Bethesda's later games, many first-person shooters, as well as being an example of a movie franchise handled well. And like so many Bethesda offerings, it stumbles under its own ambitions, lacking in polish and not exactly getting the balance right the first time, but commendable for its vision. To summarise on some of the issues, which applies more to the first game, there are too many enemies, poor pacing and level structure, often unclear objectives, on top of sometimes scripting and geometry related bugs. All these problems aside, it is nonetheless impressive in how startlingly modern it is in the freedom it allows the player. As Daggerfall Unity breathes fresh life into another X-Engine game, I hold out hope that other games share the same engine, like Terminator could also benefit from similar efforts, giving a fresh coat of paint, rectifying any issues and perhaps opening the option of being able to try out that wacky looking multiplayer. I want to thank everyone for their support so far. I stopped doing these little addresses to the audience because they seem kind of self-indulgent. In my mind, the best way to thank you is to do better content. But some people have been incredibly kind especially in the comments explicitly looking forward to new episodes or engaging the algorithm to help me out. I can't convey how grateful I am. One of the things I'm most happy about is the Azrael's tier review blowing up, since I do genuinely think there is something special about that game that deserves to be remembered. Anyway, here's the plan. I have about 160 games listed on a spreadsheet as prospective targets. All of them are over a decade old, with most on the far older side. This list grows as I do more research and stumble across interesting leads. I'm aiming for a release of a video monthly, as work allows, but this is a loose time frame and can contract and expand, depending on game and circumstances. And again, I truly appreciate the moral support. Your encouragement hardens my resolve in my eternal struggle against the Sentinel, the demiurge who oppresses us all.